Well, okay, so thanks so much uh, for being here. I know it's going to be like uh, one hour before your lunch, so I'll, I'll try to be you know, as quick as possible to make sure that you, I can let you guys off early. So today, um, it's just a disclaimer, it's going to be a talk uh, that focuses primarily on um, the game aspect side of things, on what exactly publishers look for, and while uh, I'm representing a lot of the free-to-play space uh, for mobile, um, after discussing with uh, quite a fair bit of uh, developers on the console and PC side, uh, there are some learnings that can actually be weaned or gleaned uh, from today's talk as well. Right? So, uh, a little bit about where I come from. I'm from Mixi Group of Companies. Uh, Mixi Group is essentially uh, one of the top uh, tech companies that's based in Japan. Uh, we used to have a social networking service called Mixi, uh, Mixi SNS service. Um, and we branched off into entertainment, um, and we started moving into the mobile game space as well. So I am part of the uh, entertainment business, which is also known as X-Flag. And X-Flag essentially is uh, one of the top mobile game brands uh, that's based in Japan, right? And we focus a lot on this idea of uh, thrilling entertainment. So it's all about battle entertainment. Um, all the games that we have, all the products that we have in the pipeline are all focusing on this idea about bringing friends and families together in the same space. Right? So we are very well known for one title, and that title is called Monster Strike. Uh, just a show of hands here, how many people of you have heard of Monster Strike? Monster Strike. Great. Uh, quite a fair bit of uh, people here. Uh, we are very strong in, in Asia. It means we, uh, most of our presence is actually in Japan um, and then peripheral Asia. Uh, but not many people have heard of us uh, outside of Asia. So uh, we are actually looking to, to expand and to look at how exactly can we reach out to new users outside of Japan, right? So a little bit about Monster Strike. So Monster Strike has been around for four years. We just celebrated our fourth year anniversary. So for those of you who do not know what Monster Strike is or how successful it is, um, it was actually 2016's um, top grossing mobile game ever, right? So uh, this is essentially the iOS as well as the Android uh, results are combined by App Annie. Um, and we've hit 40 million downloads worldwide, the majority of them actually coming from Japan. So if you think about it, to just put things in perspective, uh, there are 120 million uh, people in Japan, right? If the majority of that, I mean, if, if, let's say for example, the majority of 40 million people actually come from Japan, then essentially one in three persons uh, would have actually had installed Monster Strike, right? Just based on those numbers alone to put things in perspective. So how exactly do you play Monster Strike? It's very simple. It's a pinball action game. So you actually combine pinball mechanics as well as pool. Um, you sling it across the stage. You have a collection mechanic, so you can actually discover, fuse, evolve your monsters as you go along. And more importantly, you can actually play locally with up to four friends, right? So this was very novel back in 2013 when it was released in October in, in Tokyo uh, that you can actually have four people connected by Bluetooth and you can play in the same space, right? So just very, very quickly uh, about, about Monster Strike. So as a self-developed... I mean, this game is self-developed and self-published uh, by x -Lex Studios. And we don't see ourselves as a games company or just a, a, a pure wholesale publisher, right? What we see ourselves as is an entertainment brand, right? And we think about building this media mix strategy uh, beyond uh, just games alone. So I think just to tie in a little bit about, you know, what you can actually look out for your publisher as well is essentially what can they actually offer beyond just the distribution, the basic distribution, the user acquisition efforts, uh, for your particular product, right? And is, the key idea is to build a sustainable, long-lasting brand uh, for your title um, that's out there in the market. So for us, we move into live events, online, offline. We move into goods, merchandising, anime, comics, movies, and game. Uh, just a little bit of perspective, we're the first Japanese company to actually uh, re distribute like free animation on YouTube. So short form, seven minute, uh, seven to 10 minutes animations, uh, 200 million views so far to date. We've also collaborated with uh, Warner Brothers Studios to actually distribute uh, the theatrical release of this movie. So it's all about building that, that long-term pipeline. Uh, we also had our 
uh, festival, so we call it X Flag Studios. 40,000 people attended um, just this year alone. So last year was about 30,000 people. We also had like an esports category where we had a 300,000 USD prize pool this year, and last year was 200,000 USD. So it's all about you know keeping the brand relevant and keeping the product you know in the in the mind share or keeping the, the product uh, with sufficient mind share of um, your game users. So of course merchandising. Some EC store pop-up stores. Uh, we also look at uh, you know moving to the retail space. We just opened this uh, this year, so we are talking about a cafe where we can actually put in all the products um, that that belong under the X Flag brand. Uh, tie up with uh, local metro stations or railway stations here, so where you can actually have events on each of the stations that you drop at. Uh, IP collaborations, uh, sports teams collaborations. Uh, so, food, so and so forth, right? So it's a very holistic aspect of things and it's something to think about you know, when you're building your title and when you're discussing a publisher, how exactly can you bring your brand to the next step, right? And I think it has to be a very long process. It needs to be a long discussion with your publisher. It needs to be you know, very uh, strategic with how you want to position your game and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, but I want to move on very quickly um, because today is going to be a lot of input um, from, 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 my, from my side to you guys, so I want to make sure that I get all the key points across. Uh, and essentially, seven tips on what publishers are you know, looking for. And I think more importantly, how to structure your approach um, so that you can actually have a meaningful conversation with your publishers and to actually find the right fit for you. Right? And in, in the spirit of uh, Level Up, right, I'll have seven key points, one following the alphabet of Level Up. Right? So the first one, letter L, you know, is to actually learn how your publishers think, right? And a lot of people don't do this, right? A lot of people you know, do not put themselves in the shoes of the publisher when you talk to them. So what happens is that you have this disconnect, right? So I'm going to share with you a little bit about what publishers are actually thinking about when they are speaking with developers like yourselves, right? Uh, how many of you, you know, you know, sure, just, just shout it out for those of you who might have an answer to this. How do you think publishers actually decide on what games to develop? Yeah, shout it out. Yeah, sure. Uh, how do you think publishers decide what games to publish? Or how do I choose my developer? Based on the community? So you're trying to say it's like based on um, the community of the users within the game itself, is that correct? Uh, yes. Okay, so essentially what we're trying to say is that there's already some, some level of results that have been proven, okay, and then based on that, can show that, you know, hey, you can extrapolate this and say, if you put in more marketing dollars from a publisher perspective, you can succeed. Uh, that's pretty much uh, accurate as well. Uh, but to be honest, uh, because there's so many games that are out there in the market, especially for larger publishers, what happens is that you get flooded with about... 20 to 30 requests for game publishing uh, for one particular publisher every day, right? So you have a lot of different teams that have very different um, focus on games that they need to bring into the company. So what happens is that everybody is very subjective. I mean, it's very subjective, isn't it, right? Like some people may enjoy one game more than the other. So what they do is they actually have a very standardized metric to grade your game. And this is true for... Uh, the mid-size, the large-size companies, uh, large-size publishers, when they have to go through lots of games to decide what to publish, right? Um, they, they, these metrics differ, right, uh, by company by company, but just to share with you, this is what I would use for myself. Uh, this is not representative of what, what Mixi or x -like does, uh, but this is something that I'll recommend that you think about um, whether is it from a mobile free-to-play perspective or whether is it from a PC console uh, premium perspective, just kind of look at it from these five key pointers. This is probably what we think, we think about when we look at your game. So it's CRESS, C-R-E-S-S, -S, so core loop, retention, engagement, social, and store. So just very, very quickly, for the core loop, we're looking at three key points. The first point is on this, the game loop of your game. Right, the appropriate session length, as well as the meta game. Right, so this is for the first key point. So I'm just gonna start with like a very simple definition. So the call loop is based essentially how the user you know, engages with one single session for game. Right, so if I pick up the phone or I turn on the PC and I play one round, 
right? Whatever I engage with, the content in your game, all the way to the point where I stop playing, I put down my phone, that's one game session, right? So that's one game loop, essentially. Uh, more complex games have multiple game loops, um, and I'll explain to you a little bit, bit, but the simple one, here you go, the one here on the right, simple core loop, uh, it's very simple. Start quest, you deduct energy and stamina, and then after that, you move on to the end of the quest where you get rewards, and then you upgrade your characters, and then you repeat the loop over and over again. That's why it's called a loop, right? You guys might already be familiar with this, so just walking through the basics. Uh, some examples, this is uh, pretty much a uh, Clash of Clans uh, multi-game loop. So one loop, the clockwise, uh, it's all about growing a city and then attacking, battle, and then after that, you know, the anti-clockwise version is actually the defense loop. So whenever you open your phone and you go through one loop, you can, you can either you know, go through the attack phase or the defense phase, or you may even go through two of these loops at the same time, right? So the level of, just to, just to make sure that it's clear, like when you say this game is a mid-core game or a core game, right? Your depend is not so much on the genre itself, but rather how many sessions a user actually play within your game. So a hardcore user, a hardcore gamer, a hardcore game will essentially have a lot of sessions being completed within one play sitting, right? So uh, that's why you have like games that have 45 minute play cycles versus. Uh, games with like Candy Crush, which is a one or two minute play cycle, right? So therefore, you determine uh, what genre or what kind of uh, uh, category your game will actually sit in. So very quickly, the, so the appropriate session length was just what I just mentioned just now, right? So how long do you expect each game loop to be? It really determine what kind of uh, game category your game sits in. Um, and what you know you should be who you should be targeting towards. The meta game is also very important. The meta game is essentially uh, the thinking outside of your core you know, gameplay process. So there's an in-game and then there's an out-game. So when you look at the out-of-game, so in-game is really more about the battle aspect, right? If you have a battle game. And the out-of-game is when you start thinking about, okay, I want to add on more equipment to my characters. I want to put in, uh, you know, I want to collect more monsters. That is a meta game because how you think about improving your characters will then improve your overall gameplay. Right? So this is what we think about when it comes to the first point on call loop. Second one, retention. Uh, three points, progress management, sub-goals, and grinding. Right? So uh, first one on progress management, I say this RMP there, it essentially means reward and punishment. So they're always, you know, it's, a very, it's, it's very psychological in terms of how you approach games. Right? Uh, people are driven motiv or motivated primarily by reward or punishment. Uh, there are sub-goals. There needs to be sub-goals within the game. So there are overall arcing goals at the end. And then after that, what are some of the steps and stages that player must go through to reach the end goal or the end game? And then the process must be fun, you know, and at the same time painful because you have to go through the loops over and over again to grind, right? So some examples here. Uh, this is the definition of retention. Um, and then some examples here will be here for progress management, the reward and punishment. So the one on the top is the reward mechanic. So essentially, you know, when you constantly log in, right, you get rewards. Um, and if you don't log, if you don't defend your town, you're actually punished by, you know, your resources being taken away. So this is a very good example. COC really captures this reward and punishment mechanic uh, very well. For sub-goals, uh, if you look at this, is heyday, right? Supercell example again. Um, they had this mechanic on their achievements where you complete like individual steps, right, to get more currency, in-game currency, so that you can actually become stronger in-game. But this is cool because, you know, it gives you a very small goal to actually work towards, right, as opposed to why am I exactly building my town, right? What is the end goal of this game? And then having all these small goals help me reach the end goal, at, um, uh, you know, through a very systematic process. Last one, grinding and fun pain. Um, you, if you guys are familiar with Final Fantasy series, you play Final Fantasy, you know very well that you want to level up, right? You have to keep going and grinding um, as many monsters and stages as possible so that you can actually get stronger as you go along. There's a reason why people do that, right? It's because it's a sense of accomplishment and this level of this fun pain that, that users actually have. So think about this idea of grinding uh, when you're making your game, right? And this is what really publishers really look for because it will help with the overall retention. 
right? And you want people to keep coming back to your game over and over again. Um, and yesterday at a Google talk, um, a guy uh, from Google Play, he was saying that, you know, day one to day seven retention is actually very important because immediately after day seven, you know, you have a huge drop off of players. Uh, whether is it, you know, for mobile, I believe it's the same for PC as well. Uh, so always think about retention. Retention is actually the number one thing that a lot of uh, game companies look out for right now, just because of the fact that it is very hard to get new users into the ecosystem, right? So keeping users is number one priority as opposed to getting new users. Number three, engagement. Okay, so story, player experience, this is a UX and game predictability. Um, how do I actually define engagement? Is essentially how much activity does a person do within a given period of time, right? So what exactly did they do? So um, three simple examples for the story segment here. This game is uh, Everyday Cool Running. It's a, a game made by a Chinese uh, development publisher. Um, it's just a very simple running game, right? It's an infinite runner, but there's a context to it, right? It provides this reason to why you're actually running. And it's very important because players need context. They need, they need to be guided to why they're doing the things that they're doing. Uh, play experience, um, I think one thing that's very important about this is the idea of the first-time user experience. When you go to a publisher, right, and you demo the game, make sure that the experience, that, that user experience from a publisher standpoint is actually refined, right? So in the industry, we call this FTUE, right? So always make sure that your first-time user experience is optimized. Um, and I think more importantly, to make sure that there are no bugs uh, when you show your, your demo to the producer, uh, to your publisher. Um, very good example, Supercell does their first-time user experience very well. You know, not saying that you should always just look to Supercell for examples, but I think there are a lot of learning lessons from what they have been doing. Um, one example for Monster Strike uh, is on game predictability, right? As a company, as a publisher, we stand for the idea of um, user surprise first, right? We always want to give something fresh to the users, and I think you should too when it comes to games. We always have different events that happen, so either on a weekly, fortnightly, monthly basis, always new events that are happening within the game. Think about it from a PC standpoint, think about it from a, from a mobile standpoint as well. How can you keep your game relevant and fresh? Um, that is the key. Okay, number four, social. Collaboration, competition. I think this is something very familiar uh, for most of you here already. If you keep thinking of multiplayer, this is pretty much it. Uh, I want you to think about how also there are the in-game and out-game social mechanics, right? So uh, number one for collaboration, uh, it's very simple. Alliance, forming, player assist, team raids. Uh, I don't think I should explain too much into this when we talk about multiplayer. And the second one is on competition. Right? How exactly can you have more meaningful PvP within the game? So this is something that is quite self-explanatory when publishers actually look for multiplayer aspects. Number five, store or monetization, in-game economy, product offering, pricing, and promotion. So very quickly here, uh, it's actually essentially the mo it's essentially the motivation to purchase, right? So how exactly do you structure your store? How exactly do you structure? Um, your, econ your in-game economy to a way that encourages people to uh, buy or more importantly, stay after they have purchased, right? Very good example, Heyday again, you know, I think a lot of games do this right now. This, this Heyday example was in 2013, right? So you can actually use uh, more modern day examples uh, on how exactly uh, people use hard currency um, to, to, you know, to pay and increase uh, their gameplay. So always have soft currency. Right? So do not have direct transac transactions if you're doing uh, free-to-play. So never ever have, like, let's say for example, X amount of dollars to translate for, let's say, a weapon or equipment. Um, In-game, always have a soft currency to intermediate um, the purchase. Uh, pricing, make sure you know how you price your stuff. Offer uh, things that users want. Uh, and last but not least, always think about you know, how can you bundle it up so that it's uh, more attractive uh, for the users. Something that you guys might already know by here. So if you want to take a photo, this is the best slide to actually take a photo of. Um, it's just a summary. Um, think of it as like a checklist of sorts, but it should, not be, it should not be mutually exclusive to what you hear from the publishers. Okay, sorry, are we already done? Oh, okay, no, okay, so just take it. Um, these are pretty standard, so this, is pro this should be one old, you know, university course study 101 for you guys, okay? I'm going to move on because uh, we have not enough time. Three, two, one, next. Okay, level number, uh, alphabet E of level up. 
um, expect each publisher to be different. So, you know, for us, you know, we have a very different expectation. Each publisher will have a very different understanding of what exactly they, they need from the games or what kind of games they want to publish. I would definitely say do not have a one-size-fits-all approach. A lot of developers think that, okay, just because this publisher says this, therefore, you know, this publisher, uh, I mean, it will be relevant for this publisher as well. That's not true at all. So make sure you tailor your pitch to each publisher. Moving on very quickly, uh, V, right, of level up. So V, verify capabilities and requirements of each publisher. A lot of developers go into the conversation very quickly by, by saying, hey, this is my pitch. What do you think about this game, this game, this game, right? Um, problem with that thinking is that, great, you know, I really applaud you for your gung-ho mentality, but you need to really understand what is the publisher's portfolio, what are the, what are the strategic interests of the publisher before you even pitch to them, right? Um, so that, you know, you don't waste any time, you know, uh, trying to pitch something that they're not exactly going to be very interested in, interested in from, the, from the beginning, right? And all you have to do is just ask, what are some of the publisher strategies that, that you have, right? And I can tell you, for example, for XFLAG, our strategy is very clear, right? We work primarily with co-development opportunities. We would love to look at games that provide this battle experience and help encourage this local uh, play face-to-face -face player experience. It's very simple, right? Uh, just ask the publisher, now, and I think very importantly as well is that what can the publisher offer you, right? So for us, you know, we have a very, very cool suite of distribution techniques, uh, marketing techniques that we actually employ. But what does the publisher, on the other hand, provide for you? For example, if you're talking to a Chinese publisher, obviously, uh, then, you know, for that particular market, they should have a uh, set of uh, distribution techniques and abilities to help your game reach out to as much audience, as many audiences as possible, right? So you might want to ask and be a little bit more diligent in asking these questions. Uh, e, err on the side of caution, right? And this is really all about making sure that you, you know, do not overpromise, right? And then underdeliver, right? So this is this is one of the mistakes that usually happen. Um, when, public, when developers actually come to us, right? Uh, when they say, hey, you know what? You know, this game has potential reach. You know, we can be top 10 grossing in Southeast Asia within X number of months, and we can recoup this back by so-and-so, right? Um, I would definitely be very careful because as a publisher, we've definitely seen more games um, from all over the world, right? And we are able to make a better judgment on what can or cannot be you know, feasible based on your claims. So make sure they don't, you don't make um, huge claims. Uh, and if it's too good to be true, it probably is. And that's what all publishers will, will really think. Um, so from a developer perspective, how can, you, you know, how can you move forward then? Right? And the idea is that uh, you need to kind of underline the risks when you start your pitching with your with the publisher anyway, right? So what are some of the key risks that you feel that, are, that you know, will, will, will be in your particular project? Do you foresee potential competition coming up within this space? Do you see your, your development being delayed? Do you see an uh, issue with uh, marketing this particular game as an IP, right? So always make sure that you have uh, all these potential risks and address how they can be solved. And last but not least, right, not least fun is very subjective. Right? A lot of developers are making games for themselves, not really so much for their users, and I really have to iterate over and over again that you are not the end user. Right? So a lot of gamers, which is great that you're making games for yourselves, but if you want to actually have a larger appeal, if you want to, have, you know, to be able to target the audiences that you want, you are not the target audience. Right? You, can, you should never always be the know it and the, the final checkpoint right, for you know, what the end user actually wants. So bring, put your game out there, talk to as many people as possible of your t potential target audience and be able to get you know, honest feedback, uh, not you know, industry-level feedback where everybody's just you know, cheering you on just because they don't want to let you down, right? So really go out and get as much honest feedback as possible about uh, your game and how fun the game may be. Uh, last L for level, uh, look at your numbers, right? So for mobile gaming, um, LTV, ARPPU, DAU, UpDAO, these are 
the industry terminology that you can easily check out online. How exactly do you calculate LTV? Uh, you can also check out online. There's a lot of reading materials on how to actually do that. So LTV is essentially the lifetime value, and it's very important to decide what your lifetime value of the game is because it will affect your entire monetization, right? So lifetime value, let's say, for example, a particular user is $20, right? That means that um, the user, from when he installs your game all the way to the he exits the game, right? He will buy at least twenty dollars worth of in-game products, right? This is the free-to-play model. The you know the premium model is a bit different. You should really be thinking about number of copies sold over X period of time. Uh, but the idea is look at your numbers very clearly. How exactly you do that? You know, very simple. Just go online. You know, app intelligence for benchmarking, app any, um, new zoo. So many websites that are out there. So many services that are out there. They may not be free. Uh, but that's where I always defer to the third point, make friends in the industry and get those numbers uh, from each and every one of you, right? So combine your resources together when it comes to intelligence because you must understand that at least for the Southeast Asian market, your competition is not within Southeast Asia alone, right? You, you have to compete against um, the global standard, right? And that means you're going to have games that are going to come in from Europe. You're going to have games that are coming in from China. You're going to game, have games coming in from North America that will be competing in your space just because it's a growing and emerging market, right? So you guys should band together, especially from a Southeast Asian uh, pub, uh, developer perspective, band together, get those information. And then when you approach a publisher, you, know, you have the sufficient numbers to back your story up. You understand and build your USP, right? So USP is your unique selling point. And uh, let me explain a little bit more about what this essentially means, right? Um, one thing that, that is very important is when I ask developers, okay, can you just tell me the concept of your game? Uh, you get this really long paragraph trying to explain you know, what the game is. Um, and I would definitely say that it's a huge mistake because if you can't explain it simply, you don't really know the concept of the game well enough. Right? So it should be short, succinct, and to the point on what exactly it's trying to convey. I will also say that uh, a simple test right, to ensure that everybody in your team understands the concept of the game is to ask, essentially, what is the concept of the game? And if you have three different answers right, from three different team members, right, you have a problem with communication. You have a problem with uh, your game not being very consistent uh, in what you want to, what you want to accomplish. Right? And it, it tells, when a, when a publisher plays your game, right, it is very obvious to the publisher when one part of the game is not synced with the other. For example, the art style might move in one particular direction, but the gameplay might move to a second for, for, for a separate uh, audience, a target audience to begin with. So always be very careful. Make sure that you've identified your concept very, very well. And to build in that direct, build your, your unique selling point. Right? Which ties into the last point, uh, which is very clear on positioning your game strategically. And what I mean by that is, I think in the previous talk just now, you guys already had an exploration of white spaces, right? Where to put your product within a 2 by 2 axis. Uh, this is very true when a publisher looks at the game as well. They are looking at white spaces too. Why is this game so different from any other game out there that's in the market, right? And if you're aiming for the white spaces, is it very clear to the publisher what those white spaces are? Right? And you have, to be very, you have to be very careful as well. Right? Because if you make a game that is, you know, I want to make a game that everyone can play, right? then essentially no one will play the game. So it's a simple marketing rule. Right? If you try to make a game for, you, know, you try to market a product to everyone, you will hit no one at the end of the day. So be careful with your game positioning. Be very careful with what your game seeks to achieve. And uh, aim for meaningful difference. Right? And what I say by this is that you'll get a lot of developers that come up, and I get this issue as well. Um, I hear this issue from um, PC and for the PC and console side as well, is that they try to bring in concepts, they match concepts together, right? So, and you hear this a lot as well in, in different speeches that you get a lot of people trying to be different for the sake of being different. Um, so you, know, you have like a Candy Crush RTS uh, mechanic, and you know that doesn't make any sense at all, right? Um, but you know, they are trying to do it just for the sake of doing it. So I would definitely recommend if you are you are trying to be different, if you are trying to aim for those white spaces, how are those how are those changes or difference differences actually very meaningful? And essentially, how is this experience you know very different if I were to play it as a user, right? And will do you feel that the target audience that you are addressing 
will be actually playing a game. And the only way you can actually find out is to start going out in the market, doing a little bit more research, actually putting the concept across you know, the minds of a lot of different people, ask them what they think, or maybe even make a prototype right, and put it in the hands of your target audience to actually play it. The only way to be very sure is to constantly test. Yep. So this is essentially the um, seven point summary, right? And I think it's a very good um, tie-up as well. So learn how publishers think, right, as a grading system. Always remember to think about the grading system. Expect every publisher to be different. Uh, verify your capabilities and, and requirements of your publisher that you're looking at. Err on the side of caution. Um, I mean, this is essentially with regards to not um, over-promising, under-delivering. Look at your numbers, right? Look at your projections. Make sure that when people ask you how many copies are you expecting to, 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 have, to be sold over this period of time, you have an answer, right? Uh, understand and build your USP, right? And at the end of the day, you need to build your product strategically. Thanks so much, guys. Yeah. A big hand to Landry Lee. Uh, do we remain on stage? We've got a.